In the past, MMOs were regarded as the godfathers of that's games. Right. They were the peak of what developers could accomplish. Even yes. though, looking back, that's a fairly subjective thing to say. Everyone knew MMOs had the power to create cult following, but also everyone knew making MMOs was hard. On average, MMOs, MMOs are the hardest game to create, even now. It always has been, and I think it always will be. MMOs are just too big. It's like three different genres mushed together. And it's also why it destroyed my life. <laughs> it is what it is. At least six years in the baking before it can get anywhere near being good. Yes. But that didn't stop companies from jumping onto the bandwagon anyway. And soon we could see dozens of new MMOs, all releasing in 2008. All being called the WoW Killers. Yes. Spoiler alert, none of them did that. And unfortunately, I've been waiting. I've, I've said this so many times. I'm still waiting for the next WoW killer because the next game that kills World of Warcraft will be better than World of Warcraft, which means I will finally be able to relive the glory days of Kuroto. We can feel the ripple effects even now. It got to a point where every time a new MMO is announced, we it's all the WoW think killer. the same thing. Oh. Anyway, when yes. you're working on an <laughs> MMO, you have to respect three pillars. Gameplay is king, social interactions matter, and the world setting is important. When Riot announced their MMO, it became clear that two of the pillars are being respected, and the third one is already done. Yeah, I mean, this is something that I, I don't think a lot of people realize, and I, I also didn't know, right? Because I am not a League of Legends player. I know nothing about League of Legends, basically. So... When I heard that there's going to be an MMO set in the League of Legends universe, I was like, how does that even look like? How does that work? It's a MOBA. Is there a lore? And then I realized, wait, they've literally written lore for every single character. There are like cinematics for all of them. And then when things like Arcane came out, I was like, oh, oh. So what you're saying is the biggest MOBA on the planet actually also has one of the one of the most intensively written lores behind it. Okay. Okay, that's cool. Done. When it comes to the gameplay, it is currently in the hands of Ghost Crawler, someone who's been Ah, uh, he's left now. Working on WoW during its best times, and someone who got a reputation for hating Boomkins and loving mages. When I also don't like Boomkins. Social interactions, it is a dance between the developers and the players. A dev can guide players towards social interactions, or they can annihilate them. And after that, the players usually find their own fun inside the MMO. From that point on, the devs should do everything in their power to support the players having fun in their own way. Yes. And finally, this is something people meme on a lot, like Blizzard nerfing fun, but like it hurts how much true it, uh, how much um, how much truth there actually is in that, right? Because with a lot of these things, like game balance matters, right? You need to strike some sort of balance, or it will be destructive to the larger game. But there also exists cases where Blizzard fixes things fixes things that do not need to be fixed like for example for the longest time they had limits on transmog right because it didn't fit into the world the explanation they gave is sound right they want the world to have a cohesive style and they don't want people in like chicken suits running around at random times of the year and they just want it to be sort of a seasonal seasonal funny goofy thing right but the thing is the identity that came with like those recognizable silhouettes and not having wacky goofy things it was already long gone like there were so many pieces of transmog that did not fit into that philosophy that sort of limiting it and using that explanation makes no sense and just makes the game l less fun so at that point like what are you trying to uphold just let people wear whatever the hell they want is going to be fine we're going to have people running around in chicken suits it does not matter it really does not, you know? And, like, even recently, I think there were, like, um, flower crowns, right? And you couldn't transmog them year-round. And it's, like, a flower crown. We have druids in the game. Why can a druid not have a flower crown the entire year? It's not that deep. We have literal... Like, one of the BlizzCon suits is a literal yeti, like, Wanzi. Like, come on. When it comes to the world of an MMO... Just make the game fun. In Riot's case, it's done. And it's been finished for quite a few years now. Okay. In fact, the world of Riot's MMO is in such a good state. They already have the continents, the zones, the cultures, and the races. And to a lesser degree, every zone already has its own storyline. Hold now, up. Now, of course, unless you follow the lore... This looks badass. ...of League of Legends, 
you wouldn't know about this. And that's why I decided to make this video. That also looks badass. I want to show you all the zones we are going to see in the MMO and what sorts of quests we are going to do there. So, for the purpose of this video, I will assume you have no idea what League of Legends is about. You have yes. no idea what the universe is about, but you like MMOs, your hairline is receding, and you have a crippling fear of Nintendo 64 controllers. <laughs> to which I'm... Yeah, just in case someone needs to, needs a translation of that meme, he's talking about Asmongold. I might add, <laughs> why do you think I'm wearing hats? But now, without further ado, let's have a look at all the zones in Riot's MMO. Okay. This is Rune Terra, the world of League of Legends. Right now, the world is separated into 10 main regions. But these 10 regions don't cover all the land on the map, so there are some mini zones in between them. And the lore already revealed that there is gonna be another continent further to the east. That okay. definitely sounds like this looks big. Like a future expansion to me. In fact, it would be foolish to release all of these regions at launch. You can easily turn half of these into separate expansions. This is something that I'm really curious to see how the next-gen MMO handles, right? Because that is something WoW did, and I think it has aged very poorly. I think, like, expansion design itself kind of needs to be rethought in terms of how zones are implemented. Right, because having expansion zones, obviously that makes sense, right? When you when you have new content, you want a new area to explore. But the thing with like World of Warcraft, for example, is that you sort of you had the base content, and then you move everyone from the base content that you worked on for literal years, you move them to the expansion zones, and that's it. That's where the game happens, you know. So I'm kind of curious to see how they handle that. Because we have so much, like every single game at this point. If they don't look at World of Warcraft and they're like, okay, so World of Warcraft messed up here, let's not do that. World of Warcraft has been messing up with this for the past decade, let's not do that. We have a lot of very, very good examples of what not to do, you know? So, I'm curious to see what they do with that, whether or not there's some sort of housing or something like that that they do. And because a lot of people already know and love these regions, the hype behind these expansions would be big. With that said, I know a lot of you would like to play as Shreemans or Ionians. And now you may be cursing me for suggesting that these would be expansions. But the lore can justify giving you these nations as playable races without having their regions. Okay. I'll show you how Riot can pull this off in a bit. First, let's talk about the regions Riot's MMO has to start with. The Northern Continent. Yes. This entire continent is called Valoran. We have, we have wintry Valorant, mountains, big win. Valorant. And this is where the absolute core of this world is. The two main regions here are Demacia and Noxus. They are the two big rivals equivalent to the Horde and the Alliance. While I would like Pl to say that Demacia is- Please don't tell me we're gonna have factions. You know what I just said about we have history of what Blizzard did right, right and wrong? Let's not have factions in 2023. Clearly that idea was cool, but it doesn't work anymore. Your classic normie human region. Let let it's everyone play really together. True. It's Rune not that Terra deep. doesn't really have a normal place. There is something cool happening in every region, and Demacia has racism. Okay, maybe not racism because Demacia doesn't mind yordles or minotaurs, but they really hate mages. That's because in the past their rivals almost annihilated half of the world <laughs> using magic. And so, Demacia was built inside a magic-absorbing forest. Therefore, Demacia is a really cool place where you can hide from magic. When it comes to the Okay. That actually sounds really, really, really cool. I like that. That is really cool from a, like, flavor perspective. I like that. Like, if it's not factions, but it's certain zones that you sort of... You can enter, but you're putting yourself at a disadvantage, and you're sort of putting yourself in danger, that sounds really, really cool. Visuals of the zone, you can see a lot of lush fields, it is surrounded by mountains, but the iconic part of the Masia are the buildings. They are made of petricite, which is a combination of stone and the magic-absorbing wood. Because these ancient magic-absorbing trees were grey, all the buildings have a marble-like appearance. Ooh. And yes... 
I mean, this is kind of typical fantasy sort of, sort of, I mean, even these towers, right? This is like you're, you're coming up on a shore and you see a lot of white buildings. It's sort of an elvish, um, elvish design and everything. But I like it. Even what material they are using, all the buildings in Demacia also absorb magic. So should a mage visit this region, let's just say it's gonna be a painful experience. Okay. On top of this... I, you know, look, look at this. Okay, okay, listen, listen. I said we shouldn't have things that optimize fun out of the game. You know, we shouldn't have these things that make the game not fun to play. But this, I think, is actually really cool. If you are a mage and you enter here and you can't cast spells, I think that is cool. I, I genuinely think that is cool and I don't think it's particularly destructive to gameplay. Because if it's a city thing, then who cares? I think it's cool. Let's not forget that Demacians can weaponize Petricite. Hello, they hello. They can turn it into Petricite steel, which oh, gives you- Look at that! I want this. I want the middle sword, and I want this sword. ...your classic anti-magic weapons, and you can sculpt Petricite constructs which wake up after absorbing magic. Simply said, these guys just really don't like magic. The irony is, they've been absorbing it for years now. And this is where the story would kick in. You see, the Marcians are so afraid of magic, they founded the Mage Seeker Order. This is an order of people... Well, that's a great idea. <laughs> ...they throw them in the prison and they torture them until their body gives up on magic. So yes, being a mage is a crime in the Masia. The thing is... Like, like, look at this. You're a mage, you run in here, you cast a spell, and the city is going after you. That sounds cool from a from a flavor perspective. I genuinely really, really like that. People still get naturally born with magical abilities. You can't stop it from happening. So not only are there mages hiding in the royal court, right now there is a mage civil war happening in the Masia, where mages and people who don't hate mages rise up to fight for moral rights. So should we do some quests in this zone? This is gonna be the core story. Mages try I like to that. overthrow racist leadership following old laws. So the main enemy NPCs might be mages and witches. But I know what you're thinking now, and don't worry. There will be plenty of boars to kill here too. <laughs> or at least there are loads of wolves here, as well as stags. And we can't forget the iconic Demacian raptors. But further to now the south, a we might find some crag beasts, tiny woolly elephants, and... That's, yes, that's cute. Of course, in the Argent Mountains, there are also dragons. Oh. Loads and loads of dragons. Oh. But that's about it for Demacia. Fun fact, the capital city of Demacia is called the Great City of Demacia. Sounds dumb, but... How truly incredible. But Runeterra was not the first one to come up with this. Yes. But thankfully, <laughs> the other regions are a bit more creative with their names. So now, let's move away from the Normie region, and let's have a look at the badass region, Noxus. If you're this... planning on playing a warrior with oversized weapons and overcompen- Okay, hot take, I'm a warrior? I've always been a warrior. My nickname originally- yes, that is why people always mistake it. My nickname originally originates from Kratos, because of course it does. I just misspelled it. Um, so, <laughs> so you know, there is that. But um, I don't like playing big warriors. I want to be, I want to be a warrior that's sort of small and fast and very strong. That that's my warrior fantasy. I don't want to be this big dude. This just seems not practical. Compensating lush hair. This is the region for you. That's also true. This place there are a lot of stupid has a names. Long and badass history, but we really don't have the time to explain it now. So just know that originally it was built by the most badass warrior in the history of Runeterra. This motherfucker literally died on a mountain of corpses. And after he died, he was too angry to stay dead, so he just became the god of the underworld. <laughs> okay, you know what? You know what? You know what? Sign me up. You know what? I kind of like this universe. <laughs> like my guy just because, you know what? He, I die? Nah, I I'ma just, I'ma just become god of the underworld. Norse lore, basically, yeah, it's just like, sure, you can send me down there, but then I'll become the god of death. Why not? Okay. When this guy lived, he built the Immortal Bastion, which is, to this day, the largest structure on the entirety of Runeterra. And currently, he is banished underneath the Immortal Bastion, but only a few people know about it. 
so you know that's a future raid boss. okay this is something i'm gonna be also interested in how they tackle how is the lore gonna work are we nobodies or are we heroes that is very important because if we are nobodies then how would we go about these sorts of things how do we fight against a dude who has been kept secret and he's like literally the god of death you know how do we find out about that that's going to be interesting to find out Anyway, the Immortal Bastion is the capital city of the Noxian Empire, with Noxus being one of the most brutal nations in Runeterra. It is brutal because the nation is surrounded by rocky earth. It is hard to grow plants here. So Noxians are forced into conquering surrounding land for resources to survive. That's why when May I introduce you to the concept of trade. When you go to the map, you can notice that the Noxian territory is all over the place. It's because these are all the places Noxus has already conquered. Although, when I say it like that, you may imagine Noxus brutally raiding everything. But that's not true. They like to absorb the surrounding nations oh. into their empire. After all, it's just more human resources. Most <laughs> of the time, they only remove the royalty and they Look at this dude. Look at this dude. Look at this dude. Th this is how a warrior looks join their empire he's still like the armor is a bit too much though i want like a mix of leather and plate i don't want full plate full plate is just not practical you're just slow and that's because noxus values strength above all and rulers tend to not be good fighters this is what you can see in the after victory cinematic they killed the king because he was weak and let everyone else join them Fun fact, conquering nations is so iconic for Noxus, they have their own saying. Kill them until they are family. So when- You know what, sign me up. When it comes to the quests in Noxus, it is most likely going to be helping the empire expand its territory. Although this region- has its <laughs> So own we're basically just going to enlist in the military and try to conquer the world, okay. <laughs> own ...unique enemies too. Inside the Immortal Bastion, there is a cult known as the Black Rose. This cult is connected to the darkest of magics. So be ready to fight Hemomancers, witches, demons, and mm. the Grey Legion, which mm. is an army of soldiers revived with blood magic to fight for the Empire again. And when it comes to collecting 10 bear asses, here we have the native Dragehounds and Basilisks. Now, while Noxus and Demacia are the main rivals here, both of them are also constantly repelling raids from the north. So okay. now, let's have a look at the Freljord. This is where I want to live. Just like pretty much any region on Runeterra, Freljord has a long history. But for the purpose of this video, just know that the maddening old gods known as... Yes! Okay, you know what? You know what? This might be it. You know what? The Watchers of the Void. You know what? Devour the entire reality you know what? This might be it. Them up, once tried to breach into reality here. They almost succeeded because they tricked the Ice Witch Lissandra. I, I like how literally every single like um fantasy story now just has old gods. It's just like a, like of course we do. Of course we do. Into helping them. Fortunately, she realized how wrong she was, and she managed to freeze half of the kingdom with the Watchers still beneath them. So these days, the Ice Witch is the only person holding back the end of reality by keeping the Watchers frozen. So at some point in the future, you bet one of these woken up frozen watchers is gonna be a raid boss. Now, yes. when it comes to the NPCs, this is where things get diverse. First of all, remember that the Freljord is brutally cruel. Everything is frozen and this is where I want to live. Everything. Yes. So the first enemy here would be the wildlife. From Rhymefangs to Yeti, yes. to Ruvasks to Elnix to Mammoths to the worst of them all, Poros. Next, we are going to fight the Freljordians. Look at that! Look, look at those little dudes. Wildlife. Hold on. From Rhymefangs to Yeti. Hold on, let's look at these little dudes. To Elnix, to Mammoths, to the worst of them all, Poros. Look at this! Look at these little dudes. Next, we are going to fight the Freljordians. There seems to be a lot of suspended there apocalypses. Main tribes here. It is what it is. The Avarosans, who are quite peaceful, the Wintersclaw, who are quite brutal, and the Frostguard. Lissandra's followers who hold back the Watchers. Okay. But let me tell you, these guys have some badass armor. Among the notable tribes, there are also the Ursine, which are shamans who worship the Volibear. 
the primal god of the wild who slowly turns his worshippers into twisted animalistic monstrosities. Speaking of which, yes, there are also the primal gods of Freljord. And finally, okay, th this is where I want to live. Iceborne. When the watchers tried to arrive here, they tainted the ice around them. This special ice is called the true ice. And it is so dangerous, you will So this is basically like, what you're saying is, this is basically like, um, what's what's it called? Saronite, right? So this is basically just when the Lich King arrived and he just made it into, okay, okay, I gotcha. get it. Everyone However, just goes mad the by this, right? also tainted some people, giving them the ability to touch the ice. It is still extremely painful for them to hold a true ice weapon, but at least they can yeah. survive it. These people are. Well, this is the Lich King, okay. Ice this is Ice Crown. But people were not the only things that were tainted. There are also Ice Trolls, yes. some of whom are also Iceborn. To be honest, these guys were made to have their own dungeon. But there are also some animals that were twisted by the. That, that was so and cool! Lysandra is even twisting some beings herself to make them serve her. So overall, Freljord is gonna have a lot of cool warriors. This is me. This is me. Shamans and... This is not me. Horrors. Also not me. So these would be the three regions on the main continent. But this place is actually so big, it can easily make the base world of the game. Especially since there are... If they have player sport. housing, I'm living up in the north. Like, I'm living on one of these mountains. On one of these mountains, there's a small, like, um... Like a small wood wood chopping site, that's where I'm gonna live. regions in between them. There is Nokmerge, full of witches, Argent Mountains with their dragons. Okay, Lord actually, Dome I might live there. Void monsters, Dalamor Plains with him, and so much more. But from hmm? here, you can cleverly set up the expansions because of how well everything is interconnected. So now, let's have a look at the continent to the east called Ionia. Ionia has a very close connection to Noxus. You can only guess why. It's because Noxians once tried to conquer it all during an event simply called the Invasion of Ionia. Oh. This was a horrible war full of using children as soldiers because Noxians thought Ionians wouldn't fight back against children. And chemical weapons. Lots oh. and lots of chemical weapons. Speaking of which, remember Singed from Arcane? He's the guy who chemically devastated Ionia. Oh. Eventually, Noxus failed, but they kept their small controlled territories. So the first quest here could be simply boarding a ship. This literally looks like north. freaking the invasion on the Fire Nation. <laughs> Over and Look at this. Exploring Ooh. the place for the Noxian Empire. This is cool. Now, when it comes to Ionia itself, the place gets mystical. Everything here is alive it's too red. and connected to the spirit of nature. And I mean everything, from the animals to the people. This to the looks buildings. badass. Everything Too much red, though. Alive. So if you anger Mother Nature, your house can twist and strangle you in your sleep. Well, that's not so great. So you can only imagine how Mother Nature fought. A Remember that next time you don't wash out your little yogurt cup. Against Noxians, usually a river came alive to drown them. That's why all the buildings here look like they were woven from wood. It's because I love this sort of design when things are like sort of magic, woven together. Let nature build their houses. It also means that sometimes your house can just. Yeah, this is too much red. I like the design, but it's too much red. Walk away. Like I imagine logging onto this. It's 3 a.m. and I just get flashbanged. I don't like that. <laughs> when it comes to the NPCs here, obviously there is gonna be a lot of nature spirits and a lot more. This looks of badass. Simply mystical animals from giant flying tiger. Okay, this is a store mount. <laughs> this is what they put on the store. The never-ending story. But be ready to also face local okay. Ionians, blade masters, okay. shadow cultists, okay. murderers, okay. and ninjas. Both okay. good, bad, and the in-between. But finally, okay. there is also one more enemy that we could okay. face. The furries. That's right, this race is known as the Vastaya. They are half humans and half magical animals. So, so these, these are... Oh, <laughs> I didn't mean to pause on this, but this is the perfect example, okay? So this is what people make. They go to the central city, they climb on top of the mailbox, and they start dancing. That's what they do. Okay. And I get yes, it. yes, canonically, the species was born in exactly the way you are thinking. But to be fair, the Vastaya are... I might. Okay. Quite cool, I'm not... and they are definitely gonna be a playable race. 
just like Yordles, who also like Ionia a lot. Look at this dude. Lastly, Th this dude looks like from um. Definitely gonna be a playable race. Just like this dude looks like the um. I forget his name from Kung Fu Panda. Yordles, who also like Ionia a lot. Lastly, after Noxians ravaged Mother Nature, demons started occupying all the places filled with misery and doubt. So Master Shifu, yes, bonus yes. So yes, the exploration of Ionia and the raid on the Shadow Order could be a really cool first expansion. But okay. it's definitely not Riot's only option because we can also go south to Piltover and Zorn. These are the ones people will know about simply because this is where Arcane took place. Oh, okay, so Piltover I know this. And Zorn are two Honestly, like in terms of in terms of vibe, I'm not a huge fan of the sort of steampunky atmosphere. I've never been a huge steampunk guy, so. You know, based on what everything I've seen so far, this is probably going to be my least favorite, but I mean, I loved Arcane. I loved literally every second of Arcane, and that was set in this, so, you know, One if it's good, other. then it's good. And they are so massive, they could easily be turned into their own playable zones. They are both focusing on futuristic technology powered up by <clears throat> magic of the Hextech gemstones. Using this magic, they can power up anything from guns, to augmented limbs, to vehicles. Visually, it is simply futuristic. Um, so th this, this right here. Anything from guns. Where is it? To augmented limbs to vehicles. So as you can see, this little thing, this little thing is what I spent, I believe, three months farming for every single day. In Mechagon. In 2018, I believe. Visually, it is simply futuristic Victorian era. And it's unfortunately, yeah. there wouldn't be much of enemy variety. We would likely fight the rich houses of Piltover and their deadly assassins, with the occasional thief on the streets, corrupt wardens, and the occasional rogue steam golem. But things yeah. get a bit more interesting in the undercity known as Zorn. The Zorn undercity is, the is like underbelly covered in that was my favorite part. Smoke. Because the majority of people are poor here, they developed a cheaper alternative to Hextech called Chemtech. This artificial green stuff can power up cheaper limb replacements as well as highly unstable weaponry. Zorn is also controlled by the Cam Barons, which are obviously gonna be the main enemy here. But on the side, I just love the vibe that is literally on top of each other. That, that's like my favorite part, right? Where we have this complete dichotomy, where the Undercity is literally the Undercity. Right, we may also meet some chemical mutants, unstable constructs, as well as some mass murderers and people who hunt down mass murderers. And Sounds funnily fun. enough, at the very, very bottom of Zorn itself, there are the hidden ruins of an ancient city full of traps. That is obviously gonna be a cool dungeon. So I yes, was about, there is that that sounds that sounds like almost a roguelite thing, where you just go in there and try to collect that everything there. Here. That sounds Build fun. Zorn were simply explored in Arcane. So if you like the series, you are gonna like this place. Okay, From I loved here, Arcane. We can travel so we're good. further south to Shurima. Shurima used to be a massive empire that ruled the world. But after the emperor got betrayed by his best friend, the entire empire collapsed. This region is a massive desert with the occasional city near a river. In the center of the region, there is... That looks so cool! Look at that! The Sun Disk, a colossal piece of star metal that has the power to reflect celestial magic. The Shurimans use this celestial magic to turn their best soldiers into the Ascended, also known as the Golden God Warriors. However, these God Warriors wouldn't make a great enemy. Destiny? Team. I've never played That's Destiny. Because after so the I don't Emperor know. had died, the Ascended started fighting for leadership. And slowly, after learning how to use blood magic to gain the edge, they morphed their own bodies and became the Darkin twisted blood frenzied monsters that would certainly make really cool okay cool raid bosses besides this ancient evil shurima is also full of its own animals Ray. okay i i like i like myself a good lion boy look at this ancient evil shurima is also full of its own animals this is aslan and this is me raiders dune scavengers and on top of all of that Void creatures. Oh. That's because to the south, there used to be a kingdom known as Ikathia that wanted to destroy the Shuriman Empire. Emphasis so on used to be. They asked the Watchers for help. What the hell is that? 
You can imagine how that went. This is like... This is like Edge of Tomorrow type alien stuff. I love it. The Watcher sent through some Void Beasts that consumed Ikathia and polluted so Shurima cool. to this day. To fight back the Void, Shurima does have a lot of hidden tombs around with hidden God Warrior weapons. Not to mention that Shurima also has a circle of Time Mages who are trying to freeze the Void in time. Now, as I mentioned near the... Doesn't that sound particularly relevant? The beginning of the video, even if Shurima becomes an expansion, they can still easily make Shurimans a playable race because... Like, this is something I feel like games have a lot of trouble with, right? Because I think I talked about this in the um, in the interview uh, Nakrit did as well. I really, really like these vast spaces of nothing. I'm not a huge theme park guy anymore, right? I think I've played enough WoW. I just want a world more than I want, a, like, a game environment, you know? And I feel like a desert is naturally the perfect place where you would have these sprawling environments. And I kind of want that. But at the same time, obviously you can't just have literally 30 minutes of desert. You're going to need to have something. And I feel like that's that's going to be something really interesting to see how they tackle. Uh, and how far they go for the usual just like theme park, one, one location to another type of vibe. Because I want a huge world. I want to go over a desert on a, on a camel. And I want to spend 20 minutes traveling across the desert. I do. I know others don't, but I do. Are I want travel to be like an important thing. ...to Noxus. As you can see, of course, Noxians already conquered part of Shurima. So some Shurimans are fighting for Noxus. Also, as a I, I Also, fact, I, just, I just love this vibe. Like the fact that you have the docks right here and people are just trading, and there are just people chilling, and there's like a random chicken running around. This, this, is, this is such an RPG vibe. I love this. For those of you who this like is how I imagine a desert city in an RPG. I love again, it. Again, hex crystals are harvested in Shurima. That's why a Shuriman expansion would be a great follow-up to Piltover and Zone. And again, that's why Riot can easily turn only the northern continent into the base world. Anyway, going west from Shurima, we oh, arrive more. at Mount Targon. This place is incredibly unique. First of all, this mountain is not natural. I want to live there. It was literally pulled up from the ground by celestial gods. Oh. And that's because this place serves as a portal to the celestial realm, also known as Targon Prime. Oh. Now, because this mountain was pulled up, it also has some unique features. For example, you may find frozen lakes frozen horizontally on the mountain. And the very peak of the mountain is special too. Should a mortal reach the peak, despite the brutal climate and the deadly wildlife? Everyone will reach the peak. Of course, of course I'll reach the peak. I'll heroic leap my way up there, and I will spend three hours heroic, heroic leaping my way up there, trying to inch at every single place I can and just bugging out, I'll get up there. Either they Don't worry die about from exhaustion, I or won't. the celestial gods deem them worthy and they become an ascended aspect. There is aspect of so, war, aspect in, instead of fighting my way into Valhalla, I'll just have to climb up there. Got it. ...of the sun, aspect of the moon, aspect of the twilight, aspect of the guardian, and so on. Simply said, after people reach the peak, they become some of the strongest beings on the entire planet. Uh, so, of simple course, as that. the mountain is full of people who worship the celestial demigods. And I speculate this is where we could get a lot of cool armor sets. There are the Solari. This is too boat. much armor. No one needs this this much armor. I'm gonna like too much armor. To the aspect of Give me the something sun. lighter. Then there are the rival. This is too little armor. Plus the Lunari who are devoted to the aspect of the moon. But also the tribe I assume will become. <laughs> this is just no armor. <laughs> class, the warriors of Rakor. They look course, cool though. Besides just humans. Targon also has all sorts of furry Vastaya. Near the bottom of the mountain, you may notice that the- This looks beautiful! Look at this! The mountain is alive, but also there are stellar corns, a variety of mind-bending creatures. This is me right here. Creatures, ...and loads and loads of dragons. Speaking of which, remember that this place is linked to the celestial realm. Okay, hold on. You know what I need to know? Is there some sort of, um... Are there, like, seasonal celebrations in-universe? Because if I cannot celebrate Christmas in this game, I'll be forever disappointed. If I cannot celebrate Halloween in this game, I'll be forever disappointed. The rest I don't care about. I just want Halloween and I want Christmas. The rest, kind of like, I don't care. Who 
Okay. So this is where we may also meet the star forging celestial dragon Aurelian Soul, oh. as well as all sorts of other celestial beings. A lot of these would make for interesting bosses. In fact, the ascension of Mount Targon would be a really cool raid. Next, on the other I'll just side, get up there. Shrima, it's fine. there is Ishtal. This is a special place where people are mastering the elemental magic. They are using it for everything: fishing, smithing, walking, and this place. So this this is this is where Avatar: The Last Airbender takes place. I like. I'm sorry. I don't know how they're doing walking. classes, but if I can if I can level up some sort of elemental magic to move around faster as a warrior, oh boy. Imagine being able to double jump and leap around as a warrior. That'd be badass, because I'm playing a warrior. Like, like it's, it's literally, I don't care what classes there are. There's obviously going to be a warrior or a gladiator or a fighter or something like that. I'm playing that, like, clearly. But and I want magic as well. This is definitely going to be saved for an expansion. Basically, oh, remember never when Ikathian asked the Watchers it's gonna be an for expansion. help? And then that happened? Ishtal was their neighbor, and after they saw the Void devour an entire kingdom, they believed the Void would soon devour the entire world. So, using their elemental magic, Ishtal built massive walls of plants around their entire region, isolating themselves from the rest of the world. For three and a half thousand years, Ishtal stayed isolated, believing that the world outside of their walls was devoured by the Void. But now, that okay, okay. Very recently, some mages found out that the world outside is completely fine. So now, the Ishtali mages are okay. So this is something that is really, really hard to tackle. Three and a half thousand years. They should be so drastically different that it's mind-boggling. I, I want I want to know how their culture and everything else differs because when you have things like these like basic things like language should obviously be completely different but everything should be completely different you know when you have someone who's been split out for three and a half thousand years slowly revealing themselves to be honest Ishtal is the most underdeveloped region in Runeterra oh okay we know the region has a lot of hunting Vastaya deadly plants and some elemental dragons Oh. Most of the region is still a mystery to us. This is really so cool. So at least here, Riot will have the freedom to try something new. But now, we leave the main continent to visit the last two regions. First of all, there is Bilgewater. If you like pirate I, adventures... I was about to say, is this like the sailor region? Yep. This is just where pirates hang out. Okay. It's gonna be your place. This is where we are going to explore inns and gambling dens. Even some local temples worshipping the god of, of course, Morgan. the old gods of deep waters, okay. Nagake Boros. Here we are going to fight pirates and sea monsters, sea witches, sea vastaya, maybe some demons. And possibly we'll side. This is me right here. <laughs> with Sarah Fortune to fight the king of the pirates, Gangplank. But it's there's gold a Roger. lot more here. Last year, Riot released their RPG, which was set in Bilgewater. So not only can we already explore this place in detail, but it even has a monster journal. Oh. And at a quick glance, you can already see some really cool bosses too. However, this place is also linked to the last place I want to show you today. The Shadow Isles. See, every year the horrors of the Shadow Isles lurk out. And Bilgewater just happens to be the closest place. So every year, Bilgewater is fighting the undead. Oh my god, I love this so much. I love when you have these convergence events. It's like once per year, this happens, and we prepare for it as it's just a normal thing. I love this trope so, so much. Halloween, exactly. It's like we are just preparing for the convergence event when we need to fight the forces of evil. It's like we spend the entire year preparing, and then we fight for our lives. It's such a cool trope. I wish everything, every single series did it. It's so good. Shadow Isles used to be the Blessed Isles, a rich place full of advanced magic. Because it's like, it's, short, not, it's not even like you're fighting back. You're literally just fighting to live. The forces just invade and you try to defend your home. That's it. It's so cool. A young asshole king who wanted to revive his dead queen. And in the process, he accidentally released dark necromantic magic. Oh. This magic destroyed... So Dylan this is basically um, Imhotep from, uh, from uh, The Mummy. He tried reviving his girlfriend and instead just became evil. 
you know, home for and killed a bunch of people. In the lore, this event is called the Ruination. And because the RPG is called the Ruined King, it may not be a surprise to you that you also get to explore the Shadow Isles there. And there they have anything you can imagine. Undead horrors creeping everywhere. And should we ever venture into these islands? I need someone to do a video. It's probably going to be pretty straightforward, right? I think um, there's a video on YouTube, I forget who made it. But like, why is the color of corruption purple, right? Someone needs to explain why the universal color for death and death magic is blue. I, it's probably because of like cold, right? Death should be cold, therefore it's blue. But I find it interesting. Because like, obviously blood magic is, is well, red. And then we have like a corruption is usually either either green or purple. That's like all, the two colors you usually see. Blue is reserved for like death magic. No idea whom we're going to fight. The ruined king who caused all of Th this is this is Arthas if he was an anime. This is banished elsewhere. Thresh who siphoned his magic. <laughs> this is Kelthazad if he was an anime. Was banished also left the Isles. And even Hecarim, the most brutal soldier of them all, is currently around Demacia. This gives me a bit too much Shadowlands vibes and it kind of scares me. So the Shadow Isles don't currently have a main baddie. So this is where Riot could push forward some of the side characters. Now, even Please though these don't be have so been the regions that are currently set up on Runeterra, Riot has already confirmed that there is a new continent further to the east. Currently, it is planned to be revealed in the upcoming Ruination novel. And so far, we know that this new continent is where the ruined King Viego is from. And this is also where he was banished at the end of his story. All we know about okay. the place is that it is quite mystical. There are yet more dragons here. And in fact, Kamavor, <laughs> which is the ruined like, King. Like, seriously, like, this, this is literally Arthas if he was an anime. Like, if World of Warcraft was an anime, this be Arthas. Like, 100% nation has a lot of draconic armor so should riot run out of places to explore don't worry they can always make up more but that's all i wanted to show you today as someone who's been following the lore of league of legends from the very beginning i can tell you i'm very confident the setting of riot's mmo is gonna be great their incredible writers have been preparing the world for years now and now it's time to harvest the fruit oh my god look at this Look at this! If you like this video, let me know in the comments below. Because right now, I still have three more topics that I could talk about in regards to the MMO. I especially want to talk about the potential raid bosses we can face, and the potential classes we could play. And as someone- I don't care about classes because there's going to be a warrior. I'm going to play a warrior. ...who has collected an unholy amount of transmog, I would love to show you all the cool armor sets this- this looks so badass. Oh my god. Universe has. But that's it for this video. See you in six to eight years when the MMO gets released. It's gonna be faster than six to eight years, right? That was a really, really good video. I'm really, really excited for this MMO. I'm really excited. I I know they're it's it's gonna be free to play and they're gonna sell cosmetics and it's gonna be it's gonna be I don't I'm not gonna like that. But I wish it was subscription based and then it can be like a proper proper MMO as we had back in the olden days. But I'm very very excited for this. I think this will be great. I'll link the video. Uh, we've watched watched a few in the crit videos before. He does a bunch of them. Uh, I'm probably going to watch the the uh, races and classes at some point as well. Uh, even though, I'm, I mean, as I said, like, if I can make a human warrior, I'm going to play a human warrior. Yes, I am the most imaginative player of all time. But I started a human warrior in World of Warcraft back in, what was it, 2008, 2007? Some, somewhere around there. And I've played a human warrior ever since then. I will always be a human warrior. There's a lot of lore. Uh, I'm I kind of want to start reading up on it. I'm not gonna lie. I want to see how they how they how they tackle it. I don't even know where to start, but I kind of want to start looking into it. It looks really really cool because it mixes a lot of things together, right? It's not just your typical fantasy stuff. It also has like a bunch of tech and stuff like that. 
it'll be interesting to see how they balance it, right? Because that's always the thing with fantasy universes. When you have when you have tech, but you have people fighting with swords, you, usually like the natural answer is why doesn't everyone with a sword also have a pistol? You know, this is sort of the the immediate question to ask. Uh, and I feel like you, the universe sort of needs to justify that with like magic or something like that, you know? Because otherwise, like, you you have a magical sword, you have a pistol in the other hand. It's kind of the the optimal setup. But anyway, a very good video. I'm excited for the ride MMO, and I'll keep following it.